My name is Elizabeth Watts Pope, and I'm curator of books at the American Antiquarian Society. Who was doing the work of printing in the 1700s in America? The answer goes far beyond the printer usually named on the title page. While the printer was responsible for the physical printing, the publisher was often a separate role, financing the operation. The publisher could be the owner of the press, or a bookseller who paid for a publication, or it could be the printer himself. Most, but not all, of the printers were men. The majority of master printers, so-called because they had risen up the ranks of the apprenticeship system and now owned the presses, were European immigrants or descendants. Most were from the laboring classes. Printers could be described as mere mechanics, but they controlled the only form of mass media in the colonial period, the press. They could aspire to political influence, especially those who published a newspaper, and even to wealth and social status. An apprenticeship system allowed children, usually starting at the age of 12 or 13, to learn the art and mystery of printing by living and working with a master printer's family. Apprenticeships usually ended around age 21, though it was not uncommon for apprentices to run away earlier. By the end of their apprenticeship, they should be skilled enough to become a journeyman printer, working for wages, running a press for others. Many stopped here because it was expensive to acquire a press of one's own, which would have to be imported or purchased from a retiring printer. Because of the scarcity of presses, journeyman printers often had to travel to other colonies to get employment. Journeyman printers who did acquire presses could then set themselves up as master printers with apprentices of their own, and so the system perpetuated itself. Ongoing relationships between apprentices, journeymen, and masters provided a crucial professional network, but so too did kinship networks. Benjamin Franklin was apprenticed to and learned from his brother James in Boston before striking out on his own in Philadelphia. Or a family relationship could be created when a journeyman printer married the daughter of his former master. Kinship networks were the main way women gained access to the printing and publishing trades. Jane Aitken, for example, was binding books for her father in Philadelphia before she took over the printing as well upon his death. Similarly, a printer's wife may take over the press, putting her own name on the title page, though it was usually as a widow. Even the first printing press brought to British North America belonged to a woman, Elizabeth Glover, following the death of her husband on the journey over. One would never know that, though, from the title page of the first book issued from her press. Others integral to the printing trades but absent from the title pages were people of color. Some enslaved men performed essential general labor, like making deliveries, while others were skilled printers or paper makers or illustrators. An enslaved pressman known as Primus did the actual printing of the first newspaper in colonial New Hampshire. Primus taught his skills to many others, including teaching Isaiah Thomas to do simple woodcuts. An indigenous Nipmuc man named Wawas, aka James Printer, was also largely unheralded. Despite working on many publications in his native language, his name appears on only one title page as J. Printer. What was printed in early America varied in language, content, and format, and it became only more varied throughout the 1700s. The majority of printing in what would become the United States was in English. However, from the beginning, printing was done in many other languages, including the Algonquin language printing done by Wawas. There was also quite a bit of printing in German, some Spanish, a little French, and a smattering of Dutch, mirroring the homelands of immigrant printers. Early American printers specialized in what could be printed more conveniently and cheaply in the colonies than shipped from Europe. The first substantial printing in a town with a new printing press was usually a newspaper. Then government printing, such as laws and proclamations. After that, printers would turn their hands to steady sellers that they knew would find a market, including religious works, almanacs, and school books. Printers had to choose carefully what to print considering the capital costs of the printing press and type and the continuing expense of paper. Different formats reach different audiences and serve different purposes. Sometimes the same content would reappear in multiple formats.
to capitalize on the advantages of each form. One example is the essays by Alexander Hamilton and others arguing for the ratification of the U.S. Constitution, known today as the Federalist Papers. These essays were quickly released in New York's weekly newspapers in 1787 and 1788. Thousands of inexpensive newspaper issues were printed and even circulated for free among newspaper publishers or were read aloud in coffee houses. Other essays, both for and against ratification, would be issued in stab sewn pamphlets, with at most a simple paper wrapper to protect them. Inexpensive and easy to distribute, pamphlets might have a print run of perhaps 1,000 or 1,500 copies. Later, in 1788, the essays Hamilton and others had written were issued in book form as The Federalist. Only 500 copies were produced in elegant, leather-bound volumes that could be displayed on someone's library shelf. With each change in format, the quality of paper and the production costs increased, and thus the price did as well. Meanwhile, the number produced decreased, along with the potential audience. Many scholars argue that printed material helped form a collective group consciousness in early America, an imagined community or a public sphere beyond the people one would actually meet in daily life. Printing could be used to expand political consciousness and circulate revolutionary ideas in relatively inexpensive newspapers, pamphlets, and broadsides. However, printing could also bolster existing governmental authority through printed laws. It could implicate American audiences in coercive forms of social control, such as through newspaper advertisements demanding the return of runaway enslaved people, as well as runaway wives and runaway apprentices. At the heart of the printing process were the women and the men who set the type, inked and ran the presses, and turned sheets of paper into pamphlets and books.